was more writing on it than just my personal. It was Screen Junkies versus Collider. Exactly. Yeah. So I was told in no uncertain terms that I was to win that match. No, you lose that match. <laughs> no, that I was to win. That I, that that there was a lot of pro, at pride, but besides my personal pride yeah. at stake, and that I needed to go out there and win that. Oh, match. right, 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 right. Um, so that was a little extra motivation. It was like Joe Lewis and, and Max Schmeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to One on One with me, Christian Harloff. Thank you for watching. If this is your first time watching, subscribe to this channel. If it's your first time listening, subscribe to this feed. Do whatever you got to do to listen to more interviews on One on One. Anytime we have a long form interview, it's on this feed here or on the channel. Today is a very, very fun episode as I sit down and talk to my buddy Dan Merle. If you watch Screen Junkies or you know whether it's the Screen Junkies show, Honest Trailers, of course, Movie Fights. The guy is a legend on Movie Fights and he's a legend on the Movie Trivia Schmodown. It's Dangerous Dan Merle who really goes into a lot. I mean, do we talk about Movie Fights? Do we talk about Schmodown? Yeah, of course we do, but we really are talking a lot about him who he was what it was like what his life was like growing up uh where he came from uh, where he went to school the kind of kid he was why he decided to do what he did how he fell into being in front of the camera it was a it was a very revealing interview stuff i didn't know about dan um and i'm glad that i did he, he is one of my favorite people in the space i say that often and even more so after this interview with him so Take a listen. I hope you enjoy it. Leave your comments and hit Dan up. I think it's at Merle Dan on Twitter and let him know what you thought of the interview. Have fun. Hello, everybody out there. Welcome back to One on One with me, Christian Harloff. And we'll just start off and say that if you haven't been watching on the podcast channel, you can. You can go. A lot of these are on the main channel. Collider Proper, as the Afterthoughts guys call it, or you can find it on the Collider Podcast YouTube channel. But if you're listening, obviously, you want to subscribe, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere that, that podcasts are found, really. If you're listening on your on your Android, go to uh, Podcast One and, and do that. I have uh, I have a friend of mine in the studio, not just a guest, it's a friend of mine, and we've been working together throughout the years now. I'd say it probably was almost like six years, yeah, something like that, something like that. And I have, and I say it every single time. I say it whether I'm talking about him, if he's not in the room, um, if he's in the room, he's one of my favorite people in the space. He's a good dude. He's in, he's one of the most honest people that that I know. And I, and I wanted he actually reached out to me to be on the show, and I was honored by that. And he, if you watch the Schmodown, I don't really have to give him an introduction. If you watch movie fights or honest trailers, I don't have to give him an introduction. He is the one and only, the former two-time movie trivia Schmodown champion of the world uh, and movie fights champion, reigning movie fights champion, dangerous Dan Merle. Hello, Dan. How's it going? How are you, my man? I'm good. How are you? It's good to sit down and just shoot the shit. I know, right? Apologies if my voice goes in and out. I've got a little throat thing, but I'm, I'm, this is going to be fun. Everybody has time. that stupid thing. I don't know what happened. It's like, w you don't know where you catch it from, too. I just always blame JT. No, but you know what? Yes, I didn't so think about that. He's looking at you. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do that, too. I'm going to blame JT. <laughs> just blame JT. Come on, JT. I know. Poor JT. He's the best. He is. He really, I mean, we like, we we like, we had him. It was like that, uh, that wonderful plague that Schmoes had, <laughs> and then we passed him to, to screen junkies and he's infectious i it's love great. that jt we love him. Uh, all right man so let's talk about you because we um last i think it was like two three weeks ago we had your um your lovely girlfriend mm -hmm. mara Kanopic on the uh, reigning movie trivia shmoda inner geekdom champion we had her on talked with her for a bit learned your whole story about how you guys met and all it was just fascinating i had never really known that full story yeah and it was really cool to hear but now we get to not only hear your perspective on it but we got to just really talk to you in general where'd you grow up uh, born and raised in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Southern boy. I mean, yeah. so you, you, um, how long did you live there for? Until uh, I went to college, eighteen oh, wow. years. Yeah, eighteen years. So what was what was life uh, like? In, uh, it's you know people hear Arkansas and they think you know farms and and, and that's cows. what I think. Of, yeah. and that's yeah, what yeah. everybody thinks yeah. so because it's green acres. That's what people. It's like I, it's what I tell people like, oh, what was it like growing up in Arkansas? It's like it was like growing up in Glendale, except there's yeah. no Los Angeles around. I mean, it's it's a suburban city. Yeah. And, you know, culture wise, obviously. Uh, particularly with movies, it was not as vibrant uh, as it is now. Uh, now, this is back in the 90s. Since then, I'm actually, if you look at what Little Rock has done, they have their own film festival now. They have independent theaters. They've really grown culturally as a city. Right. But when I was growing up there, you know, independent film stuff did not penetrate between New York and L.A. You mm -hmm. had to wait for it to come out on video. Right. 
So uh, you don't get the limited releases out there. No, you yeah, don't. They right. do now. Uh, do you they know, still? They, they, they really? do, you know, okay. not when it's on like ten screens, but right. when it expands out, now they'll get they'll get them. But right. back then, no. It's like I'd have to watch Siskel and Ebert, right. and I hear about this movie called Fargo. Write it down and then remember. Write it down right, and, and then VHS. go to Blockbuster right, and right, see what right. comes up. Right. You know. Right. So, growing up there though, and again, where's your? Well, let's start. Let's start first here. What's what's the family like life like when you so you're growing up mm-hmm. in in Arkansas? Yeah. Parents together, single mom. Single mom. Yeah. Okay. Single mom, uh, almost from the very, very beginning. But I had two parents. So I always say I, I had a single mom, but I had two parents. Did you know your dad? You have a relationship with him, or not? Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I saw him. You know, it's kind of major holidays. Yeah. Okay. You know, that so kind of thing. One of those things to where so he was, so when you were born, mm-hmm. single mom from the get go. Just about. Okay. From I see. from like six months. Okay. From and like six months on. Now I always I and I've always had these conversations with. Um, people who have single moms, mm-hmm. single dads, and their philosophies on life obviously differ. Mm-hmm. What the, what does that what does that do to you as a kid? Like, is it just you know that when you know, so like you have a very good relationship relationship with your mom. I would assume mama's boy. Uh, well, yeah, yes, and yeah. then I love my mom very well, much. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, when you when she's the one that's really teaching you everything. She, but she did not. She did not spoil me. Okay, good. Uh, in a good way, like she made you tough. She, she was very much. You know, she taught me things like you know personal accountability and uh, fair, you know, fairness, and you know, it wasn't this kind of thing of like I'm going to guard you from everything in this world. Uh, and you know, she was protective as a parent, but she would also she let me make mistakes. Yeah. Because that's what you have to do when you're growing up. If you don't let your kids make mistakes, then they don't learn. They don't learn things. Yeah, and the and world can really hit them hard it's later on. It's absolutely the truth. And I, I'm learning that, too. With my, I have a seven-year-old and, and you know the one-year-old. Letting her be. Yeah. Uh, right now, she, everything, she, everything is great. But um, so you're only child. Yeah, only, only child. child. Okay, so only child. So already, within, within minutes, learning a lot about you. Only child. Single mom, mm-hmm. um, and then what do you like in school? So what's and again, does your mom give you the kind of like got to do well in school? Got to get you. I mean, she certainly encouraged me to do well in school, and yeah. I was I was a, I was a good student. Um, she would incentivize it, but not in a sense. You know, it's just like, hey, if you get an A on your report card, you'll get a dollar per A. Or, you know, things like that. Yeah. But I I just always felt um, a need to excel. Yeah. Uh, I I wanted to be a good student. I think that. It's it's I, people have different motivations, you know, and it's hard to get down to the bottom of it. But I always felt like I if I am asked to do something, then I need to do that thing to the best of my ability. You're still like that, you're 100. <laughs> percent You are like that. And so uh, you know, but there was a time where in elementary school things came to me fairly easily. You mean as far as books? As far as books, you yeah. know, just like working, like I, you know, I worked hard, but I didn't have to like. I, I was lucky that I didn't have to work as hard as, as some other people might have had to do to get an A in class. But I had a huge learning curve. It's kind of like a thing of, like, life comes at you fast. Like, I got used to that. But when I had high school, I, I had to you, I, you had to, I had to work. Yeah. Uh, and it was the first time that I ever had to be like, okay, you can't just sort of rely on that things are going to come naturally to you. Like, no, you've got to apply yourself. It's you like have your to work. career. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you've got to, you've got to learn. Like yeah. it was easy up until now, but right. like if you just coast by, then you're not going to be successful. And, and, and so it was that choice of just like, do I not apply myself and just allow my, you know, myself to, 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 to be kind of mediocre or okay, buckle down and let's get to it. Right. And so where does that come from? That drive that you have that, you know, is that something that, Again, from your mom or just something that it was one of those things you just it just I think it was built. the example that I yeah. saw. I mean, my mom had every reason in the world to just kind of I don't want to say give up, but give up. I mean, she found herself single, not I mean, very unexpectedly. Uh, she, Can you talk about what happened? Or you rather not? I'm, he left. My dad left just when I off. was uh, well. I mean, I wouldn't say he left. My parents divorced when I was very, very young. Okay. Um, and she found herself in a situation where I had a very supportive family, both grandmothers, uh, uncles. Uh, that were you know very supportive, but you know day to day that that can only go so far. Right. And I think my mom realized that she she said that she did not want me to grow up um, wanting for anything. Not that she would spoil me, but that she didn't want me to not have an opportunity that I could have or to do the same things that other kids could do. She didn't want the excuse to be like, well, we can't afford it. So yeah. she went to night school uh, when I was very very young. 
uh, at, uh, you know, that that meant that she gave up her time with me yeah. to do that. She went from working at a bank as a teller to being vice president of, of that bank. Um, you know, she set an example for me of... Who's watching you during that time, though? Because she's got to be able to... Uh, well, when I was very young, she yeah. was with um, a, a guy named Scott, who was a, a really I good see. guy. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't remember him that much, but he really was there for her uh, through those first few years, and I, they still keep in touch. Um, and then, like I said, my grandmother, um, my dad's mom was local, so she would keep me one or two days a week. And then once I got into elementary school, you know, I do after school care. And yeah. then I had friends like, you know, I would go to friends houses after school till my mom was off work to pick me up. Uh, but you know, it, but you pay attention to that stuff as a kid. You know yeah. what your mom is doing because there are different kids. There are some kids who take it for granted and right. don't see it. And then there's other kids like yourself who say, that's what my mom is doing. That's what I'm going to do. If my mom's doing that, well, right. I'm going to apply that to to my life. And that's sort of what she taught me was just like you know, life is is what you make it, and it's not always fair. But you're not you 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 can't just expect to be handed everything. Like you, you're going to have to work for it. And I saw that. I saw how hard she worked. Yeah. And so I think subconsciously in my mind, I um I wanted to do the same thing, and I think also part of it was it was just it was the two of us. So I felt a responsibility to not be something that was uh, an extra problem. Right. You know, it's just like I can make good grades, and then my mom doesn't have to worry about it. Yeah, and it seems like it seems like you matured pretty fast, and you kind of have to at I that did. point. I did. My mom always tells a story about when we were when I was about five years old. We went to Disney World. My mom, my grandmother, her mom. And me, and she talks about the fact that I was stressed that we were going to miss our flight. <laughs> and she had to say, like, I can see it. She had to say, like, yeah. Dan, you, you worry about going to Disney World, right. and I'll take care of, I'll take care of the flight. I'll yeah. make sure that we don't miss the flight. So I think it was this thing of like, I want to help. I want to help. I want to be part of the, you know, the solution. I want to be, you know, uh, a part of the house. You yeah. know, I don't want to just just be uh, a burden. Right. I want to. I want to help. Yeah. And so you weren't. I didn't. I don't really see. You. Maybe. Maybe you were. But I don't really see you as a kid that got in trouble a lot. No. Yeah. No. Because no. of those reasons, right? Yeah. yeah. Again, it's just like, why? My poor mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's I, I really didn't want to disappoint her because all she did was like uh, was was sacrifice and give for me. So why would I ever do anything that would be, be disappointing for her? Right. You know, that just for me was just un, unfathomable. I think that's where I was going more when I said the mama's boy thing is like you said, you, she's for obvious reasons. um an idol uh, mm -hmm. and someone who really kind of shaped you into the person I'm looking at right now, you know? So when I, and that's why I asked about your dad, because it's like, is there, and there's also two types of people too. Mm -hmm. And you might, you might fall into both these categories. Was there any resentment towards your dad or like some, like, like anger? Not from my mom. No, I mean, well, I mean for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was so adult about the whole thing like there were a lot of things that she could have been angry about and i and a lot of things that i know now that she was angry about but she never passed that down to me she never let me see that yeah um it's weird because i i'm there there is but it's not something that drives me because i never knew anything else yeah. my relationship with my dad has always been the same so it's not like we had this this kind of relationship and then it went away or it changed. It was just it, that's it's, the way it was. It's, it's the way it was. Yeah. It's the way that it is. When you and got older, did you ever have a conversation with them? Or not really? No, not, no need. Not really. No need I, again, it's like what, what's the end game in right. that? Really? And you know, yeah. we, we talk sometimes. You don't need it though. Some yeah, people, some people, you say like for closure or whatnot. But for you, you didn't. You like you said, you knew what it was yeah. from the beginning. It was you and your mom, and you always accepted that, and that's what it was. And my mom also was really good at recognizing where um, positive male role models in my life would come in handy, and seeking those out. And luckily, I had those. I had those in my family. She uh, had two brothers. Uh, I, there were people in the community. My friends' dads. Um, you know, great uncles, fa other family members yeah. that, you know, if there was a problem where my mom thought that maybe, you know, there could be a, a positive male influence, then she would seek that out or right. they would just be there for me. And so, she and she knew good people. And yeah. she see, that's that's the thing, though, too. You watch. I, I, I just mentioned to you before. I saw the movie Instant Family, right, with uh, mm -hmm. Mark Wahlberg. And I and it was actually it was a really good movie. And they and they it's not like cookie cutter. They when they take these kids in, they take some of these kids that um, 
you know, grew up with these parents, single mothers and stuff too, but they didn't have the type of strong mother that you had, right? They had the yeah. the, the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. And you got to, and, and because it's like they did, they had someone that was there for them, then they weren't there. And they, like you said, they didn't give up. I mean, they did, these people did give up and the children suffer for it. Yeah. And you were blessed in the fact that you have this really strong woman who shaped you into this person again that I'm looking at right now. And you can take a lot of that stuff and the other question I have, though, too, is that I assume mm-hmm. that while you, your mom is working, she's got these these jobs, and you're hanging out with your grandparents and, and these new, and these new role models, yeah. is that where the love of movies that you start to watch movies all the time in your spare time? Well, uh, one for for definitely for on Wednesdays, my grandmother uh, would pick me up after school, and uh, from when I was very young, what we would do every Wednesday was we go to Blockbuster, we go or, or a video store. And I would pick out a movie, and it yeah. started out with like uh, Chip and Dale, you know, Rescue Rangers, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. whatever cartoons, Disney cartoons. Mm-hmm. But eventually, that like that's the first time I saw ET. Was we I rented it one day after school with my grandma. That's the first time I saw Jaws. Did she recommend it, or you just found it off the shelf and said, "I'm gonna try this"? I just found it. Wow. Honestly, I mean, it's it was I was so it's, young it, it, at the dr- time. You were drawn to it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I, I don't even know how I picked that movie off. Right. But I remember ET was one like I saw it, and then we I we every week for like three months I would rent ET. So ET was kind it. of the first movie that read, sucked you into movies. It's the first one that was like for me. I realized that there was something behind it. Right. That there was somebody makes these. It, somebody like it's not just things on a screen like oh there's people that write music for movies and there's a person who makes them right uh, it, that kind of always stuck in your head yeah, yeah it yeah. really clicked in my head as far as like you know when I talk about Jaws it's it is you know my favorite movie but E T is the one that was just like hooked me into like what is this because right. this is there's a lot going on here like how does that work because I know like my brain knows that's not a real alien but if it's not then. What is it, and right. how did and that and that just sort of kind of went from there, and so it went from renting cartoons on Wednesdays to renting movies. Now, do you get do you kind of push the limits a little bit because your mom is not around as much? You know, at times you are you as far what I mean by is renting stuff that maybe you know you shouldn't be watching. No, okay. uh, not really. I, I I mean, there's always a the little bit of teenage rebellion, but my mom my mom was pretty reasonable as far as R-rated movie. I have a big gap in R-rated movies because okay. that was pretty stringent up until I was like 15 or 16. And then she would kind of say like, you can see three a year or if I see it first and you can see it. But she was pretty like, no, you can't do R-rated movies. Right. So that's why there's movies like that I didn't see until a lot later, like Robocop and right. uh, Total Recall. You put them in your list. I put them on my list later. and then went back cool. later. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I didn't push the limits too much. Uh, and she was also pretty fair-minded. I mean, I remember when I turned 13, you know, PG-13 movies were always subject to her saying yes or no until I turned 13. And then she said, like, they're PG-13, you're 13, I can't stop you. And that's why I went to go see Beavis and Butthead do America. Because <laughs> she said one. I couldn't do, I couldn't see it. And then I turned 13 and I was like, I'm going to go see Beavis and Butthead do America. And she was like, you're 13, right. I can't stop you. That was you. the deal that you made. That was the deal that I, I, I made. I love that. Yeah, that's really uh, good. And then rated R movies as I got older was sort of like you can go see three a year. Or four a year, or you know, if it's like a Saving Private Ryan came out when I was fifteen, right. she said, you know, I given the subject matter, that's okay. Yeah. But I remember I got one back one time because I only got so many R-rated movies a year, mm-hmm. and I went to see Snake Eyes. Oh my god! <laughs> that with Brian Nicholas De Palma Cage. movie yeah, with yeah, Nicolas yeah, Cage, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was so angry that I had wasted one on that movie. And <laughs> yep. then she went to see it, and she came home. And she's like, "You can have that one back." <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. It shows our age difference because because um, that movie I saw with an ex girlfriend in at Florida State. Mm. So um, it was like ninety nine, I think ninety eight yeah, or ninety nine. Yeah, ninety eight or ninety nine, one of those two. But uh, that's yeah. and yeah, Gandolfini and yeah, and, yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. So I do want to jump back to school for a second. What mm-hmm. was? Because you said you had friends. What was the? What was the social life like? Um, in school, it was weird because I went to a magnet school, first through sixth grade, and I knew there were a few friends that I knew. But then I went to like for junior high, I went back to sort of my neighborhood school. Mm-hmm. So I knew some people, but then there were a lot of people that had been going to school together since elementary school for years. Yeah. So I wasn't really in on a lot of the social groups. And That's hard to do. Uh, yeah. Between starting in like sixth grade, I was a fat kid. Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, that's t- that's that, that's really like six was a little tough, but not so bad. Right. Seventh and eighth grade were really hard for me. 
as just far as what, people I picking didn't on know you a lot of people. Yeah, I knew, and even the people that I knew were in pre-existing social circles. Plus, you know, like I, I was bullied fairly aggressively because because of weight and stuff. Because of my weight. Yeah. And so seventh and eighth grade, looking back, were the toughest years for me. Yeah. Ninth grade was okay. Um, tenth grade was when I started sort of like finding my groove. I had my independence. I could, you know, like starting halfway through 10th grade, I could drive. Right. Um, uh, you know, but I had like, I would say I had, I definitely had friends in 7th and 8th grade. It's not like I was a complete loner. I've had a fr- my same best friend since I was 12 years old. Yeah, but that's tough. Um, that's, I mean, it's definitely tough for, again, that's why going back to what we were talking about, to where it also, because that's why I was mentioning like with your dad and then being with your mom, you know, the way she's taught you, does that also add into, because there's another, there's, there's another type of kid that could get really, I mean, in general, the, the bullying problem mm-hmm. has even amplified even more now I with social media. I can't imagine nowadays. Crazy. I cannot imagine. It's crazy. Because it, it didn't follow you home. Right. When I was in school, like, and really it didn't follow me everywhere. It's just things like gym class right. was a nightmare yeah. for me. Uh, you know, if I had a lunch period where I didn't have a lot of friends, that was a nightmare for me. But I had little pockets of time, classes where I had shared with my friends. And then when I went home and... That, that was, was like, fun. shut it off. That You're not checking fun. your phone yeah, and then exactly. seeing somebody making fun of you or something. It didn't right. follow you home. Right. And I can't imagine now if that, that what kids are going through yeah. that are being bullied because it just follows you everywhere. How do you? So is it the the heavy bullying comes in like seventh eighth grade? Seventh so eighth grade was the high, worst. Was high, so high school kind of stops a little bit. High school was uh, better, both yeah. because you start refining your interests. Yeah, and you start taking classes that are more specialized to what you want to do, which means that you're generally with people who are a little more on your wavelength, and you start becoming your own person. Yeah. Do you drop the weight at all during high school or not A little so bit. I've okay. never been happy with my weight. Okay. Never. Uh, but you, but no, I you, grew you, up you, a little no bit. No one would call you overweight. Yeah, but, you know, it's it's. I think part of it is you you always see the worst, the yeah. version of yourself that you were that. unhappiest with. Yeah. Um, and so I've just never been happy with it. Yeah. And I go up and down. Like, I want to go. I, I, I got to a good weight a few years ago. I, I put on a little bit more. I want to get off. Um, but I think part of it is you always sort of in your brain see that version of yourself that was uh, sort of pushed around when you were a kid. Well, dude, it, it, it's, it's one of the things to where in general, that's why when you talk about or watch Black Klansman last night, right? Uh-huh. And just think, obviously, the overall themes of that. But like racism, is it, it's it's taught. Mm-hmm. You know, these things are taught. And the other thing that is you, because you were um, you were taught emotionally at in the sixth or seventh grade, seventh and eighth grade, mm-hmm. that being fat was wrong. Being fat was this. You're the other. You're the other one, and you're the one that's getting. So emotionally, that's what you learn. Yeah. And then so, fast forward years later, when you're looking in the mirror and you got a fucking thin face, you're saying <laughs> my face is fat because that's what you see at seventh or eighth grade. Yeah, it's yeah. it's you know that's why that's why I say like, uh, in a way, I had it easy just because you know you 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 get away from it. Yeah. Back when when I was in junior high, and now you don't. So I can't imagine how how tough it must be, even if you're past that stage in your life, because uh, it, it is something that I, I think that I think that parent teachers, particularly in schools, are better about it now. But I think a couple decades ago. It was just like, well, you know, I mean, we'll put them in detention, but you know, that's right. kids are kids. They know how to handle. They, they, right, they, right, that's, right. that's part of growing up, and that's that's not. I mean, I, I'm glad that, that there's finally some attention to the fact that like that is it's not okay. Well, it's serious. I mean, it leads to. I mean, it's 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 led to some of these awful shootings. It's led to yeah. these um, these things in general that have happened in our society, and I and people take it much more serious now. And it can affect people yeah. forever, even yeah. if it's just. Subconsciously, or even if it's just that they're never a hundred percent happy with who they are because they were taught by others at a younger age that they shouldn't be, you know. Right. I, I don't think it's 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 drastically affected my personality, but you know, it, it does it does you do carry it with you. There's it's always sure, a part it's, of it. It's, yeah, it's a part of it's part of who you are. Yeah. And the other thing too, the flip side of I don't know if it was one kid or a couple of kids that, that were doing it to you at the time. There's one kid that kind of stuck out, but. Who the hell knows what that kid's family life is? Maybe you knew. Right. Maybe you knew. I don't know. But maybe this shit going down with that kid that what his parents maybe did to him, what family did, maybe his brother or sister or whatever it might be. Well, and going back to my mom, I, I was also very lucky to have a mom who was aware of what was going on and involved. And, you know, she's the one that told me, like, don't don't place your value on what other people say. Right. Don't do that because, you know, 
you you are you are so much more than that. You're not you're not you know they're doing it because they're insecure. They're doing it because they don't know what to do. And so she really helped Aren't soften you? that a right. little bit because she she would she did everything that she could do to put it in perspective and say like you know d- 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 you know who you are. Right. Do you ever pop one of them in the nose? No. no. I've never been in a fight in my life. Really? Never in my life. Not a physical. Not like a fist fight. No. Not a fist, not no. A, ever never. close. Um, a couple times. Yeah, but just uh, but, didn't but, do it. No, just didn't do it. I, I'm not. I, first of all, I don't think I have an aptitude for it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I would lose a fight with just about anybody that I got into a fight with. So oh, I think I was smart enough to I've not seen get, you get one. Fired up though. <clears throat> I've I gotten see, fired up. Yeah, <laughs> but no, never been in an actual fist fight. Cool. So okay. I don't plan to. Smart. Uh, especially not, not I think, at our age. I think 35 years old is a bad time to start deciding you're going to get into fist fights. I hurt my back parallel parking. I'm not <laughs> fighting anybody. Um, okay, so then the hobbies in high school are, are what? You, I mean, obviously movies and stuff of that nature. Yeah, drama tech. Yeah, okay. Uh, that entered the second uh, probably biggest influence in my life, my mom being the first. The second being my drama tech teacher in high school, Miss Benson. Um, she's the one who sort of shaped my outlook on who I want to be in context to other people and in context to like exploring my own interests who I want to be to myself in a lot of ways so I did a lot of drama tech stuff in high school stage craft lighting stage managing and then the TV class I did that 11th to 12th grade my my senior year was almost all drama tech and TV and just focus it goes back to that that initial focus you're talking about before it's like you had the goal you knew now what you wanted to do and that was it what because high school's High school's a couple things. Yeah. High school's either find the friends, focus on going to college, fuck around and don't do any of that, focus on girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it might be. Yeah. And so what 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 part of that? So you just focus on the work? Are you are you looking at because that's when we that's when we start to realize Oh, this 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 girl's running around. Yeah, you, you got a girlfriend in high school? No. no, no, it was just about the work. Yeah, and and I mean I I never saw much interest and I'm, I, maybe it was there I don't know but it was I was very sh- sort of it, it, people people it's when I tell people this they don't believe me but I'm I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of a shy person I can see I, that. I'm yeah. not the kind of person that's just gonna go up to somebody and 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 uh, start talking and you're people a passionate like, shy yeah but yeah. people say that like oh well, well how can you be like I see you do stuff like that's not what an introverted person does if you look into what introverted people actually do it's very common for introverted people to be way better in front of a crowd right. than Look at Ken, in front of Ken three Ab- people Ken at Ab- a party. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's yeah. it's so I, I'm I'm I am actually a very introverted person. I'm not the kind of person that that gets energy from being in a big crowd. I'm the kind of person that has that energy is taken out of me. Mm. Um, and so I was just sort of doing my thing and working. That's where I learned how to edit. I okay. was in high school. My teacher, Mr. Billings, was our TV teacher. And Such he, a teacher's name, Mr. I, Mr. Billings. Mr. Billings, I yeah. know. But he was very forward-thinking. He was always looking for what's next. Yeah. And, and That guy doesn't grow up to be like a, like a baseball player or work in a coffee shop. He's, no. be, he's meant to be a teacher. He's meant to be a teacher, yeah. Mr. B. And he, the first time I came to Los Angeles was in, I think, 1999. And he took me and two of the people from my class. And we came out here and we learned Final Cut 1.0. And oh, he's wow. like, nonlinear editing is what's happening in the future. We're doing reel-to-reel stuff. That's going to be dead in five years, and I'm going to take you three out to L.A., and we're going to learn how to do this this, uh, final cut thing, and then you're going to teach everybody else how to do it. And so by the time I was a senior, we had IMAX set up, and we were editing everything nonlinear Final Cut Pro, and that ended up being my career. So it's it's these little things that, that shape who you are. Well, so I want to talk about that trip to Los Angeles because yeah. I, w- I tell the story quite often on um, on Collider Live or wherever it might be that when I was in seventh grade, my mom took me to San Diego, mm-hmm. my brothers and I, for like three weeks. And we stayed, and I fell in love with California. And similar to what you're talking about with Blockbuster, how the movie stuck in your head, California stuck in my head for years. And I knew that one way or another I was going to get to Los Angeles. Yeah. I just didn't know how or why. Um, is that a similar thing? You take that trip with Mr. Billings to uh, to Los Angeles, and do you fall in love with it, or you just no. say no? You're just here for a job. I mean, we stayed in Irvine. Okay. You know, we were in, we were down <laughs> right, in Orange right, County, right. so I think we visited L. A. a couple times. We went to like Santa Monica Pier, and then we went to like Hollywood and Highland. But okay. we were mainly doing like workshop stuff. I, I when I graduated from college, I actually said I'm not moving to L. A. Oh wow. 
I knew one person that lived here. It, it seemed way too daunting, yeah. and I, I wasn't entirely sure if I could make it, if I could have a career. It just w- it's across the country from yeah. you know Florida State to Tallahassee to to Little Rock. That's a twelve hour drive, and it's a one hour time difference. Yeah, LA is across the country, and uh, I graduated, and I was like, well, maybe I'll go to Atlanta. They have some video production there. I can kind of decide if I want to do that. And I was like, yeah, New- I like New York, but and, but there's something in my head just said like. Go for you it. You dummy. Yeah. Listen, you've wanted to do movies and do movie stuff since you were five years old. And if you don't go, then you're just going to, you know, we, what, are you going to move to Atlanta and then decide in three years you're going to move to L.A.? Well, that's three years of wasted time. Yeah, you so, missed 100% of sh- the shots you don't take. So, so I moved out here. I said I gave it two years ago, two years, and that was 13 years ago. Wow. Well, all right. Well, I, we definitely. Sorry, gonna... it's very nonlinear. It's okay. <clears throat> um, because. You're a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. You're you're one of the you one of the got to be one of the top guys in the class, right? Top top ten percent, right? So I, wanna... I slacked a little bit, if I'm being honest, in some of my classes because I wasn't that interested in them. But and in this group, I have a problem with that. So. Yeah, but in this group alone, you're like the, you're, you said you're teaching kids how to how to do the how to do final cut, and we all sort of learn together. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they look at you as you know it's very similar with the way it is today. I'm sure that people are coming, younger kids are coming up to you for advice, and you're showing them how to do it. You're making friends that way through yeah. this through this club. So, and this is this is your social circle now, and this is probably yeah, your very much so. This is your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. So the comfort zone then leads to Florida State, I assume, right? Well, Florida State, I wanted to go to NYU. Okay. And then I looked at how much it costs to go to NYU and realized that I would be graduating with $100,000 in student loan debt. Yeah. Versus, um, I got I was a National Merit Scholar, so Florida State said you can go here for free for four Whoa. years. You don't have, we'll pay you. Look at that. So I went down. I, but that wasn't the only reason. I, I visited a couple places, but I went down to Florida State and and did the tour, and it just. It, it, I don't know how to explain it. It felt right. Uh, like you know, walking around that campus, yeah. I was like, this feels like the college experience that I've always wanted to have. The the atmosphere, the way the campus looks, the way that everything is is set up. This this feels like college to me. Yeah. So I I it was very late in the process actually, but I I just sort of you know talked to my mom. She was like, well, do, do you want to visit anywhere else? And I was like, I you know I I no like this just feels like the right place for me. And yeah. it ended up being the right place. So. And I want to talk a lot about Florida State because that's both. Yeah, um, where we both we both went, my both my brothers went there too, and I have a lot of similar memories of what you just said. But the thing that I have to ask, because of knowing the relationship that you and your mom have, question one: How hard is it to leave her after all those years? And question two: How does she? How hard is it for her? It was really hard for her, yeah. and I knew that. But she again, she didn't sh- she didn't show it. She really didn't, and I, I. But I knew how hard it must have been for her. But at the same time, she very much like the last thing she said to me before she left me to college was she just said, "Have fun," because awesome. she knows me yeah. and she knows like what I what I don't can, worry about the flights. Exactly, don't worry about the flights. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. just like she's just like be yeah. responsible. She's just like have fun, and that was her mindset. Was like, of course, I'm sure that it was really difficult for me, but she wanted me to. This was an important step for me, right. and she knew that. She's not giving um, you guilt trips. She's no, giving you encouragement. Never, yeah, never. It's and great. so it was, you know, tough for me. I think I went back home like every college freshman. I went back home three or four times that year yeah. just because I'd never been away from home for that long. Right. Um, but I mean, she was incredibly supportive. In Florida State, especially from where you're coming from too, you, and I can tell you, I know that this is, this is what happened to you. You felt like you're on another planet. Yeah, because it's like it is. It is a totally different universe because the the freedom. The, it's a different. Even if your mom gives you a lot of freedom, you know, it's a different type of freedom. It is. You are now. You are now functioning as an adult, even though we really weren't adults. No, mentally. I, yeah, I, I think about how grown up I felt that first year at Florida State, and I look back and I'm like, come on, you had your right. training wheels on. That's exactly right. <laughs> and you're walking around, and and you're seeing all stuff. And you went through. What was your first year? What year? I'm gonna see how much Two, I missed you by. Uh, Two thousand one. Oh, Fall of 2001. My, bro- my brothers were there when you were there. Yeah. Yeah, my brothers were there when you were there. So Maybe you, we, maybe you, we I, crossed I, paths. I guarantee you did. I mean, yeah. if all the different places, that's yeah. really cool. Um, yeah, my brothers were there. And I, yeah, because my last year was 99. Okay. That's, that's when I, I graduated in 99. So you just missed me. But I, that's when I came out here. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yes, I found myself and I found a lot of my friends and really discovered who I was at, at Florida State because same thing. I came in. 
I came in from, I mean, I did a different, little, much different road than you. I, I went to a, a small college in New York my first year. Mm -hmm. Then I went to live with my dad in St. Petersburg and went to like this uh, junior college for like a semester and then just transferred over to Florida State. Yeah. But when I got there, I didn't know anybody. It was in uh, Rice Hall. Is, is, that, is that the? I'm you, trying to it was, think. Yeah, it was the, it was Rice. Maybe I'm, that's the one, right? It's it, it, it was it was one of the worst ones. Sally, right? it was Sally Hall. It wasn't maybe? Sally. Okay. It wasn't Sally. Yeah, but was Rice Hall may be getting confused with Iona. But anyway, it was it was it was off to say they they've they since torn it down. It's it's not yep. there anymore. And um, I so I was there. I met some people there. People that I didn't really wind up vibing with at first. I joined a fraternity, and oh, then yeah. throughout that, I met a lot of people. I actually started a thing called Thursday Night Fights, that uh, and and it had rankings, it had champions. That sounds about right. It, it sounded about right, and it, it was the same structure that I used for the Schmodown, and it was very popular and very successful. P cops used to come and watch watch the fights. Uh, but anyway, the reason I bring that up is there's so much that I learned about myself. So with you, mm -hmm. what? What do you start to learn about yourself? What do you like? Does the social thing change? Be, what what happens? It was a repeat. It's weird. It was almost an exact repeat of what happened in high school. I knew one person, mm -hmm. uh, and then my roommate, who was really uh, Greg, who was awesome. Um, but it took me a while to make a lot of friends. I had some acquaintances, but my first year, I didn't really know anybody. My second year was a little bit better. And then, once again, my third year, when you start getting into your major and you start meeting people that have the same interests as you do, right. that's when – my junior year was when I started actually feeling like, okay, I've got a home here. I right. have a place Related here. Related to people. And then my senior year was incredible. Okay. Because that was all the people that I knew from the year before. Plus, that's the year that you're 100% almost invested in exactly what you want to be doing. Right. That was, uh, you know – worth all of the finding my place things because when i got there i was like i want to get into film school the florida state film school is hard i know impossible I to get into yep. uh, i i applied three times yeah. and never got in twice for me yeah um i did the theater school that was, that's where i went from i went from film to theater i did media production okay um and the, through the college of communication yeah again it's i've had an incredible amount of lucky things happen to me in my life the timing of that was such that <clears throat> back in 2004 and 5 film school was teaching you how to uh, you know, develop film and and work on Avid and and do all that stuff, which is an important thing to do. But right. media production was teaching you how to shoot on DV and edit uh, on uh, Adobe and Final Cut, and how do you do homemade production and how do you do stuff on a low budget? And that ended up being exactly the way that that a lot of production jobs took a turn toward. And the it was like the the birth. It was at the literally 2005 was two years before like the rise of YouTube. Right. And right. that's how yeah. where so much work came from. Yeah. Was that sort of low budget thing? And if you knew those skills, you actually had an advantage over people that are like, well, I'm qualified to, you know, do stuff with 35 millimeter film, but I've never worked on something this low budget. Right. I'm just right. not equipped to do it. So I got the timing on that was really fortunate for me. It's funny though you say that too because like you said, and <clears throat> we'll, we'll get into you getting out here finding finding the jobs and ultimately landing into the career that you're in now. But like. The thing is, there are kids who are maybe listening to this right now, right, or or at, at school, and their goals. And I've gotten met many messages, as I'm sure you have too, of stuff they've seen on Screen Junkies, stuff they've seen on Collider. It has inspired them. When I get out of college, I want to get a job in this space. That was not. It certainly wasn't the case when I was in school, and it wasn't. It for, didn't exist. It did not when exist. I moved you, out here. YouTube started. It, I remember when it started in like 2005 when it really started to pop. I was working at Joel Silver's company at the time. Yeah. Um, but when you you decided because you said you were gonna you didn't know where you were gonna go but finally you told yourself it's Los Angeles yeah. that's where I need to go. Now again, same question, mom. Now I'm not now I'm not you know was it eleven hours for the drive uh, twelve hours twelve yeah. hours from Arkansas. Now I'm not twelve hours drive. Now I'm going across the country. Mm -hmm. Now same thing like yeah. She knew how much I love movies. You got a cool mom, man. Yeah, I do. I have a really cool mom. Really, she really cool mom. knew how much I lived, eat, breathed, slept, ate movies. And yeah. she was like, if that's follow your dream. That's Go what for she it. always encouraged me to do. Yeah. So she was, again, I'm not easy to have your son move across the country, but she was nothing yeah. but supportive. Do you then, because like I said, when you, because high school, well, grammar school, it's again, it's, we, we know what happened. Mm -hmm. And then. High school, we discover you just start to discover what you love. Yeah. But no girlfriend. 
No. College, no, no girlfriend at all throughout mm -hmm. the whole four years. Nope. Wow, okay. So then you you fly, then you come out to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The reason I asked that too is because this is again focus in one particular thing yeah. as well as not being comfortable. And lack of confidence. And lack of confidence. Uh, very, very, very right. much a lack of confidence. So, so the lack of confidence is, is there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, it, does, it does shock me in a, in a way because it's like there are people that you have interest of that you meet inside of your circle that you yeah. still just don't have the courage to talk to? Yeah, I, well, I mean, when we say relationship, like no serious relationships, right. you know, you, you meet people, but okay. I just never really had the confidence to ever take that, you know, as far as just like, oh, should this be a relationship? I, okay. I, I don't know. I got but there intimidated was, or scared. But or you like, went on I, dates I really and things like of that me. nature? Yeah, I mean, I would go on I dates and stuff, okay. but it's just like, I was just like, ah, they don't like me. So I'm you not going to. You're, you're looking in the mirror and seeing that kid in the seventh yeah, grade again. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I, and I, I started to lose my hair at that uh, point. And it's just like, so the, the weight thing was resolving itself and an entirely new crisis of confidence was emerging. That's tough in college, So it's just like, yeah, it's like nobody. That's happening to nobody else. Right. So I just was just like, what, whatever. I'm just gonna do what I do, and it's, if something happens, great. But it's I'm not gonna, you know. Right. I'm okay. You, you weren't searching it. So, no. Right. But you were searching the career, and you go to yeah. L. A. What's where do you go? What's the first? What's the first thing you do when you arrive to LA? Did you have a job? Like, what? What do you, you just go out and you, you save up money? You get an apartment. I got an apartment. I got. Uh, when I moved here again, this is a this is a recurring thing in my life. I knew one person. Right. But he worked for something. How'd you know that person from where? I went to college with him. Okay. He was one of my college roommates. Okay. Um, he was working with, and again, it's all timing. This is 2005, the rise of the web. There was something that is still ongoing in Los Angeles called Channel 101. Okay. It was started by Dan Harmon, who's gone on to do Rick and Morty and Community, mm -hmm. and Rob Schraub. Who uh, did uh, he does like a lot of uh, he did Sarah Silverman program he did a comic book called Scud the Disposable Assassin okay. but they were both sort of had come to L A had a bit of a, a bubble up with Heat Vision and Jack which was the Jack Black mm -hmm. Owen Wilson Fox pilot it was yeah, one yeah. of those things that got passed around on VHS because people were like this is amazing I remember that and, and I remember when Action the Jay Moore show was getting passed around too you yeah. remember that yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but they had sort of had that bubble up but then it didn't really go anywhere right. and so they both were just like what do we do? So they started this thing called Channel 101, which is basically a mini television network. And every month, people get together and they watch 10 shows. Five of them were voted back from the from the previous month. Five of them are new ones. Okay. And then everybody watches them, and you vote, and then the top five go on. So shows right. get canceled, shows get picked up, people can cancel their own shows. My friend Rod had been working with Channel 101, so he knew all of these people. And through one of those guys, I got my first job, which was a office PA job for this uh, ABC show called Emily's Reasons Why Not. Okay. It starred Heather Graham. Oh, wow. It was counter programming to this was the first year that ABC didn't have Monday Night Football. Okay. So they were like, well, we're going to put on counter programming with this Heather Graham sitcom. Uh, it lasted, I worked on the show for four or five months. Uh huh. We shot like doing what? Uh, exactly. Just working in the office. Okay. You know, so lunches and what to take in the orders and you, you name it coffee, right. bagels, right, right, you know, okay. just to go yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, we worked on the show. The pilot had already been shot. So we were we were working on like the, uh, the other episodes that were going to air. I think they made like seven of them. Uh, they aired the pilot and they canceled the show after one episode. Oh, sure. So nothing that I worked on or that anybody worked on in those four months yeah. ever saw the light of day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a great crash course in how yeah. things can work in Los right. Angeles. Right, of course, because you're probably painting when you first get the job, you're thinking all these great things are going to happen, and yeah. then and then it's a matter of okay, well, this is how it really goes down, and mm -hmm. and um, all right, so that. That hits you in the gut, but it doesn't. It doesn't knock you out. No. Yeah. Uh, from there, I. I mean, I was a PA for a very, very long time. I worked at a company called Super Delicious. Okay. Which did show they have a. They, they did a show called Mansers, which was like and, uh, trivia for it's not dudes. About Scott Mans, it was on the. No, it's not about yes! Scott Mans. It was, yes! on, it was on the yes! Spike TV network. Mansers. Who's right. got the biggest boobs in the world? Uh, we'll tell you right now. Right, right, right. Hal Rudnick actually was on that show. Really? And I had no idea. Oh, wow. That's just, it's you like, never this crossed weird, paths. No, I'll I mean, I'm sure I'd probably seen the footage, but right, I, just, right, right. I wasn't working on time. set. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and they did, you know, they did like a lot of, uh, right now they, they do like Halloween Wars now and they do like kind of like cupcake okay. food network shows. But I worked for them for a few years. 
worked on a farm for three months on this you, reality oh, show, okay. dating show called Farmer Wants a Wife. You worked, a, you worked more on that farm there than you did in Arkansas. Yeah, exactly. That was the, <laughs> that was the most I was spent on a farm right, right, before right, working right. on a reality show. Right. And, and, and I mean, they were. It was a, it was a steady income for a real long time. It was kind of a gig job in the sense that, like, if they didn't have anything going on, there'd be layoffs for a few weeks at a time. But it was a pretty steady job, and I was actually a post coordinator there. Okay. But I hit a ceiling after two or three years where I realized that I wasn't. I wasn't really going to advance anywhere past where I was, right. and it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. And so I just sort of, when the, when the next gig came around and they're like, hey, the next one starts in a few weeks, I was just like, no. uh, you know, I can't, uh, um, I, I think maybe I'm just going to move on. Now, the problem was that that was in 2008. Yeah. And then the economy completely tanked, and uh, there weren't so many jobs. So right. I bummed around literally for a couple years, and... Uh, just grabbed whatever random things. I was on unemployment for a while, yeah, but because the economy had tanked, uh, they weren't putting limits on it really. So I was able to uh, just survive, literally for about a year or two, and then uh, I took a couple more jobs. I worked in a vault at a at a at a color correction place. This was the place yeah. that like took me to the, 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 the long stories. For yeah. This is everyone's career in Los Angeles. Yeah. I worked at a vault and uh, where at a color grading company. And I, w- I was doing okay there. I, I was a, I, in about a year and a half, I'd worked up from just like uh, just a guy who worked in the vault to a, a night operations manager. And I, I'd probably still be working there today. But I just, you liked it? I, I hated it. Oh, you hated it. I hated every oh, minute of it. Okay. It was miserable. Yeah. It was not what I wanted to do. But good money. It was good money. Just, it was steady and it yeah. was good money. And I was so desperate for a job right. that I just, I came that close to just saying, Hey, it's stupid to turn down um, a, a consistent career, and this is easy money, and you know this is you w- live in the real world. Right. You know, the, you, you've been living in some dream where you're going to get a job that you love, and you need to be realistic and just this is this is how it's going to be. Yeah. And I I just I hated it so much. I feel like you have these a lot these, a lot of these inner monologues. I like, do. Yeah, because the thing is, like you said, you've had one one friend for the most part to where whether it's college or yeah. high school or, or out here. And I mean, now I I know you very differently because of, of how we have we have met and the, the, like the circle of people that you yeah. that you hang with or or, or have hung with. Um, but there's that, and especially now because we you know like I said we had Mara on a couple of weeks ago. I know that I know who you have in your life, mm-hmm. but at that but a lot of time you just have you. But in the background to all of this career stuff, I continued to work with Channel 101, and I loved it yeah. and, because it was just working with really passionate, funny people, and everybody's doing it for free. I mean, there were some jobs that got going. Rick and Morty spun out of Channel 101. Yeah. Rick and Morty was a Channel 101 show before it was Rick and Morty. So there were people from Channel 101 that would sort of get grabbed up as these shows would sort of spin out of it. But really, everyone was just doing it for fun. And over the intervening years, I had been making stuff, and then I realized that maybe I'm not the strongest writer uh, or director as yeah. I had been making my own stuff. But I was like, but man, do I love editing. And so I started editing more stuff. And so... In the background of all this, I moved up to sort of producing the screenings and doing a lot of editing and doing a lot of special features and like many documentaries and filler pieces for in between shows. Right. And I really loved editing. I, I, I just loved doing it. It wasn't work for me, it was like putting together a puzzle. And so I hit a point with that job with uh, where I was working where I hated it so much. I got my tax refund one year and mm-hmm. I found that I loved editing to such a degree that I was like, okay, I'm gonna take one last stab at this. Yeah. And I took my tax refund and I quit that job and I said, I'm gonna be a freelance editor. Mm. I'm gonna try it. And if this doesn't work, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But through that, I edited ki- uh, Gen Air kitchen videos and a lot of piece work, a lot of just like, that's the gig work of just yeah. like, gotta grab whatever. What do you add? I don't care what it is. I'll edit it if you're gonna pay me to do it. But through that, uh, Brett Weiner, who worked at Break Media, yep. uh, had known me through Channel 101, had seen some of the stuff that I did, knew that I was looking for work, and said, hey, man, we're, we're trying this new weekly show called The Screen Junkie Show, and we're doing the first episode. Do you want to come in and edit it? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I took that took that gig, and then they did another episode. And, and I what took year that is this? Gig. This is 20, 2012. 2012, okay. Yeah, I took that gig, and then that became a weekly show. And then I edited a trailer for a Channel 101 thing, and Brett's, yeah. Brett saw it, and was just like, oh, you can do trailers. So he was like, do you want to try editing an honest trailer? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I took that gig, and then it was 
uh, then I became a full time editor. So how far is uh, along is Honest Trailers? Because Honest Trailers is the the bread and butter. It is yeah. what shaped Screen Junkies to yeah. what it is today. It's Emmy uh, nominated. It's 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 huge. It's it's it, yeah. It's millions and millions and millions of views. Um, how far along is it? And what's the success like before you got to it? It, uh, they had done seven or eight, I think. Okay. So it, and had they popped yet? The way that they, yeah, oh, they oh did? yeah, okay. no, the Twilight had popped big. Okay. Um, Transformers had done well. They were starting to transition it from here's the thing we do every once in a while to this could be a, a regular show. So I actually came on Skyfall was my first okay. one, which I think was maybe their twelfth or thirteenth trailer or something like yeah. that. And that was when they sort of said like, okay, we're gonna do these every two weeks instead of just whenever we, you know, want to. Right. And then eventually it moved to every week. So So then you're there now and this is a gig now. This is this is your This is my gig. It's I'm permalance, which if you don't for it's, that's a LA term, but yeah. it basically means I'm a freelancer in the sense of like I'm not an employee of the company. That's what I was like a bachelor. But yeah. they pay, but I'm, but they expect me to be there. Every right, day. and you're basically getting a salary just on the benefits and exactly. all that kind of stuff. Which too. is uh, they you don't see as much of nowadays, but, right. but uh, you see a lot of it. Um, but yeah, so I was basically a full time job. I just wasn't technically an employee of the company, which changed later on. But. Okay, so then so that that's happening, and that's when around that time is when I met you. Because yeah, you Screen became, Junkies show. Yeah, because you then became a producer of that show. Yeah, as Screen Junkies grew, yeah. at the same time, the company that owned Screen Junkies at the time, Break, they didn't really, they hadn't really divvied everything out channel wise. There was just one common writers room for like everything. Yeah. So like there was like four writers, and they all had to write not only honest trailers, but like pitch for Movember and pitch this show, pitch five different shows. So like they were constantly just overwhelmed. And so at a certain point, they were like, I don't have time to do the screen junkie show. Dan, you're editing it. Can you can you direct it? Like you know how you you know you know each other. You know yeah. the rhythm of the show. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So that's when I met you. Is right. I started to kind of go in there when they were shooting Screen Junkie Show, just to sort of say like, hey, how can you retake this? Almost as an editor. Really? Like yeah, we yeah. didn't get that clean. Can you retake that and retake this? But then yeah. that moved to like producing and directing it. Yeah, which was when you, super. Well, weird. that was the thing is that we always, and I think that's one of the reasons that we would click because I'd come in for these like the summer movie mm-hmm. previews or the whatever the, the movie that we're looking forward to seeing. Yeah, and. You know, you, you talk to people off, uh, when you're not shooting, and as we were going over it, not just you saying, okay, we want to try to do this, go to this angle. It was more of, well, yeah, I saw this movie, and I like that movie. We start talking about conversations. I remember always saying to Ellis, yeah, Dan knows his shit. I was like, that was that was the thing. Is that Dan Dan really knows, you know, how, the way this business works and and what movies to see. Director is very knowledgeable, but you weren't on camera. No. Yeah, and it's like, and and it wasn't something you ever even thought of. No, you you kidding me? I, know. I was an editor. I, know. I was behind the scenes. I know, and, it's um, like, and now you're like you arguably one of the biggest stars that Screen Junkies, the, the as, you know, honest trailers aside, uh, the stuff that you guys did with movie fights and Screen Junkies news and and the Screen Junkies show. Some would say that you're the face of of Screen Junkies. I'll, I'll say that you're the face of Screen Junkies in regards to that type of stuff. And it, it, that's bizarre to you. Yeah, because yeah. it was ne- it was a complete accident. Yeah, I, literally, I think maybe the first Screen Junkies show I did was. Uh, something about Jurassic World and it was only because the trailer came out and we were fighting about it and they're like, let's just film it. Were you nervous about doing it? Not really because there was no stakes. I was like, well, okay, sure. Uh, Movie fights was the game changer for me as far as like, oh, people like, uh, first of all, there's a lot of revisionist history going on because when I first started doing movie fights, people hated me. Oh, really? They hated me. Really? They were like, this guy is way too serious. He's arrogant. Huh. I still I still hear it a lot. He's arrogant. He's way too seriously. He takes this this game way too seriously. He needs to lighten up. Um, like the first two or three episodes, that's all that I saw was was just that. Really. Um, and and to be fair, going back and looking at it, I, that it's true. I had to sort of learn to, when to ease up off the gas because I'm super competitive. Right. I'm no. a really competitive guy <laughs> and a really passionate guy. And so when I'm in a thing of like, I got to win this thing, it's like, oh, I'm going to win. Right. B- whatever means necessary. And I had to learn a little bit about scale and context. Um, but I never thought, like, that was just an experimental show because they were like, hey, YouTube wants longer programming, so we're just going to do this thing for probably 10 episodes to the right. end of the year. Right. We're like, okay. And then it blows up. And then it becomes what it is. And, yeah. and it's been insane from there. And then it's like, okay. People like movie fights. Is there anything else you want to do? And I'm like, I like movies, and I like reviewing movies, and I think I'd be okay at it. So then we have the premium network, and they're like, okay, we'll try Why don't you do your own show? I'm like, 
sure. So I do a show for the summer. I start reviewing movies, and then that spins off into its own right. thing. It's super, like I say, luck is a huge factor in yeah. everything that's happened. But it shaped your career. It shapes kind of how a lot of people know you in the space, and it gives you opportunities and, and things of that nature. I mean, it, you, again, listening to the interview with, uh, with Mara, it's essentially how you guys – became uh, together because yeah. she she was a fan of yours she yeah. she had watched you she she related to the way that you argued uh, on, on 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 movies and you guys bonded over that and talked star trek when you guys yeah. met which was really cool um and those opportunities came from being on camera now you mentioned the the network the the screen junkies plus right yeah. now screen junkies plus it, it was when so if you guys aren't familiar right now we talked about it on Claire live and, and it's been out in the news Defy Media, mm -hmm. they sold Screen Junkies to fandom. To fandom, yeah. So, which has made you guys safe in what happened here in the, if you guys are reading the reports, that uh, Defy is is going under and they're not, you know, it's 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 a mess. It's yeah. an absolute it's mess. A me right? and people just left completely high and dry. Yeah. People like Chris Stuckman, people like Mr. Sunday Movies that that, that were, through their MCM, that, that were just are owed massive amounts of money. And, and I know YouTube is says they've been working with them and I hope they're continuing to work with them but it is an absolute mess plus people like uh, uh, people that worked at Clever uh, people like you know Aaron Robinson who did uh, movie right. fights a lot yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, and that entire yeah. team over there uh, people that worked at Smosh Smosh Games yeah. like everybody just like like that right out of a job like a Thanos snap uh, literally yeah. uh, but it, but it was everybody right and and it came out of nowhere well, absolutely nowhere it it did in a way in a way but when you look at that, because you, because I always thought I never under, I got to tell you, I never, I mean, and we can we can discuss it. I don't think we, sure. we ever argue, but I I never understood Screen Junkies Plus for this reason. When it came mm -hmm. to original content, I I understood it like stuff that you couldn't see, mm -hmm. but everybody was doing long form stuff. Everybody yep. like that you could get for free, whether it was here or in, in general. There was there was uh, Schmoes was doing it, uh, and the AMC was doing. There was there's yep. you could get long form content anywhere. Movie fights you can go. Mm -hmm. But when Chris Stuckman has a panel show and when Jeremy Johns has a panel show and you're asking for $5 for that, that's a hard model to sell. Yeah. Um, and I think that because – and I know that they dumped a lot of money into it overall because you got to get Johns <laughs> yeah. and Stuckman and Andre. you got to pay those guys, right? Yeah. And that had to take a big knock in the knee to ultimately what happened. Let me tell you – all right. Let me – I could do this now. At this point, you're not an employee there anymore. At this point, I'm anymore. not an employee there anymore, yeah. and there's no real company. I, let me tell you about Screen Junkies Plus. Um, that was that was a defy idea in the sense – well, it was a hybrid. We saw that we were – with movie fights, we were like, hey, people seem to really kind of be connecting to – the not just honest trailers, but to screen junkies and to some of us like individually. That Spencer had already established himself. Nick Mundy was a big part of the Definitely. channel. Hal was always a very uh, big personality. Everybody kind of had their own camp, and so we had talked about like what are our options for expanding our programming. The main channel doesn't really, it still doesn't really support a lot of programming because there's a big chunk of people that are just there for honest trailers. Right. So there's discussions around like, do we start a second channel? And that's kind of what we thought we were going to do. We we're like, okay, we're going to start a second channel and, and kind of spin out a bunch of different programming and try to do what we want to do. Right. And then at, at some point this model came through where I, I don't know whose idea it was, but they're just like, these premium things, they kept on talking about rooster teeth. These premium things are working, and we want to try to make some deals, strike some deals with different people. Mm -hmm. We want to do this premium network. Like, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's when things started to kind of go wrong. And it's weird because it's, it's – Was it a blank check type situation but just spent poorly? Well, yeah, but it was a blank check, but also, like, I, I just think that the things were not handled – uh, well, uh, the app didn't work. Yeah, um, there was going to be a release date, and it got pushed because the app didn't work. Right. We knew the app didn't work, and Defy knew the app didn't work, and 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 it's not necessarily. I wouldn't call it incompetence on the people that built it because Defy developed that thing in house, the whole thing in house. Yeah. They didn't hire a third party. They had in house people developing that entire thing and the functionality that they wanted from it and the different shows that it had. To, I mean, like, that's an almost impossible task. That's hard to do. To and that's do, an amount of time, at, too. In house. Yeah. yeah. With people that, you know, like, that's, that's like, they're, they were really right. good, smart, talented people building it, but they, they weren't app developers right. that wasn't their career so the app didn't work we knew it didn't work right. we launched the thing the app didn't work we had a free preview weekend the first weekend didn't work yeah. nobody could watch anything for free didn't work 
uh, still, the first th- the first however many weeks of Screen Junkies Plus, the only narrative around it is the app doesn't work. Right. Uh, th- three or six months afterwards, they do some market research and they sit us down and they show us numbers. What do people think of this person? What do people think of that person? What do people think of this show and that show? The numbers for every show, as far as the people that were watching it, uh, were high. People are like, you know, they might not like everything, but they're like, I like this show a lot. I like Stuckman's show. I yeah. like Monday's show. Yeah. I like, you know, uh, uh, does it hold up? We're, we're pretty high. The overwhelming thing that the users were saying, and especially the users that had left, was, I left because the app didn't work. Yeah. And they're like, well, we know the app doesn't work. And yet the app never got fixed. Right. Never got fixed. It was never functional. It never worked like it should Why have. Why are they cutting corners on that? They're going out spending all, spending all this money on I d- talent. That's, that's, that I mean, was the baffling and, thing. And, huh? and it's not – there was no one at, at Screen Junkies who was not doing their part. I know that there was advocating from every level at yeah. Screen Junkies saying, you've got to fix this. There were people saying, like, I will use your service if you allow it to be uh, used with PayPal. And so we'd ask, when is it going to be with PayPal? We're working on it. I will use your service if you can make it compatible with Roku. When is it going to be compatible with Roku? We're working on it. Right. I will use your service if you can get an app for PS4 or Xbox. When are you going to happen? We're working on it. So, so much money was left on the table, and we knew three months in that this was probably not going right. to work. And yet, we continued doing it for two years, partly because we had a very passionate core fan base that loved it right. and loved our programming. And that was great. To know that we were servicing the people that were using it and that they were enjoying it was enough for us in the sense of, like, we didn't feel like we were wasting our time. But at the same time, it was very frustrating to know how much we were leaving on the table Yeah, to the fact that it just was never properly functional. Well, and then and it was yeah. so frustrating. I'm sure it was. I mean, because especially when you're pouring your hearts out to it, the passion's going into it. Everybody who's putting. I mean, and when I say that about the the panel shows, it wasn't that they were weren't good panel shows. It was just a matter that there were panel shows was, out there. It was always meant to be. Um, not that you're going to sign up for one thing. It was always meant to be like all. we're going to produce so many different kinds of things right. that. If one panel show or whatever isn't your thing, we've got a game show for you. Right. And if you don't like the game show, then we've got a watch along. And if you don't like the watch along, then here's a more serious discussion about that. And if you don't want that, then here's a more jokey discussion. It was supposed to be like, if you don't like one thing, that's fine. Right. We're going to give you something else. And I and I feel like we delivered that as far as the programming sure. goes, but it just was no one could, no one could watch it. Yeah. And so nobody watched that. And so that's one thing. You guys do that for two years. And obviously, yeah. as a business model, probably for Define Not the Smartest Thing, because you drain in money or the people that they were supposed to pay, uh, people that they did pay, things that happened and started going down. There's a big scandal that happens last year. We won't yeah. go too into that. That So there's two, there's two things, though, now that really start to cripple. Because before you get into – before those two big things happen – before that, you're kind of in the glory years. You know, mm-hmm. movie fights is hitting like 600,000 yeah. views an episode. Honest trailers crushing it. You guys are, are living the life. It's like it's it. it you're, yeah, you're, it I mean, we're like, not we're not making uh, millions of dollars, but, but, but we're no, having fun. But you're having fun, <laughs> yeah. and it's like again, you're doing you're going to cons and you and you're, you're, you're the, the movie fights panels are, are you, you can't it's great. They're great. It's like you're getting recognized. First of all, before I'm gonna go right back into this. Mm-hmm. First time you get recognized has to be really bizarre. weird. For you. Yeah, incredibly bizarre. Like it. it, it literally went from one year, the, the year before Movie Fights started, um, or actually, no, the year Movie Fights did start, I want to make sure, no, no, oh, sorry, it was the year before Movie Fights started, yeah. so uh, Movie Fights starts in October, this is in July, the year before, I would walk the floor with Hal every year, and we'd be shooting stuff, and so Hal would be, the because Hal was the face of the channel, right? so Hal, people would come up to Hal, and just, uh, you know, like, hey, Hal, run it, can I get a picture, and I would be the guy that would take the picture, and then I just remember one time, this guy's talking to Hal, and he's and he's just like Hal Rudnick. Oh my God, Screen Junkies! I love you guys so much. Everything you do is so amazing. And like like I'm such a big fan. And Hal's just like, yeah, this is Dan. He like directs and produces a lot of the stuff we do. And the guy just goes like, hmm. Anyway, I love the Screen Junkies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah been, so to go from a cop the, all the time, yeah, yeah, to go from that in a year to go from that to like people wanting to say hello to me is is I still find it weird. Yeah, it's super weird to me. Right, and it goes back to you know, it's your personality. You yeah, know, still, I mean, I, I see it at the you know people. You're when we'll talk about it before I let you out of here is that you're you're a schmodown legend. My instinct is to downplay anything that anyone says about me. So I know, like you're awesome. I'm like, no, I'm not. Don't and don't, you do don't that, say that. And you do that to everybody. It's to, <laughs> to my detriment, to be yeah, honest. Sometimes. Yeah, and um and so but but going back into it. So then the, the, you know again those two things happen mm-hmm. with the fight. The the honeymoon period for those years where you guys are on top. It starts now. Starts to pivot. Because because the money's going out of uh, 
uh, you know, Screen Junkies Plus doesn't work. It's yeah. some could say it just it, it was a, it was a, it was bold. It was risky, and it just it just didn't work. It was a big risk. It didn't work. Um, How and- different is the office though? After Screen Junkies Plus, we said we're shutting it down. Um, because if it, there's layoffs now, things are changing. Yeah, and I mean, well, that's that's the other thing that happened yeah. is in the time that Screen Junkies Plus was happening, simultaneously, the entire online media industry was changing. Mm-hmm. It went from there are 30 power players to there are 300 power players. It went from there are 10 sites doing movie news online to there are 1,000 sites right. doing movie news online. Right. So, you know, if you look at the views... You know, new things would pop up, and then a lot of the established people, us included. Yep. But I think really across the board, views and stuff started dropping because so many people were kind of welcome into the space yep. now that people it was segmented, and new it was fractioned. There was new platforms. Yep. There was Snapchat. There was people going everywhere. Yep. Twitch. So, uh, you know, the the, the screen junkie, we they started screen junkies plus like right at the beginning of that, yeah. which is uh, they couldn't help that timing, but it's not great timing. Right. So you know there were. Right, but the, the other thing is, right around the time we ended Screen Junkies Plus, we started Screen Junkies News, which I'm very proud of. I think that we we had a really rough start with news, and I feel bad because there was a lot of people that we brought on to work on the channel, producers and writers and stuff, and the site, mm-hmm. which doesn't exist anymore, that were part of a vision that did not ultimately work out. Um, as far as like, how many times a day are we going to do videos? What kind of content are we going to do? And it was just, I think, a function of nobody really knowing what direction to take. And also, a lot of people I don't think were being listened to as far as I know what we should do and that not being taken. Right. I'm really proud, particularly since we came back last year. I think Roth is a great editor-in-chief. And I'm very proud of what we built on news because I think that it is unique in the sense of, like, it's the channel that we always wanted to make. As far as how we want to how we want to leverage our personalities, the kind of programming we want to make, yeah. um, but we weren't given the license to do that necessarily when it first started. So there were a lot of people that I feel badly about that like it wasn't so much a big blow right when Plus ended because we were bringing on a lot of people and then a lot of people were just shifted over to do news programming. The problem was when we took the shift on news and decided we're going to go a different way. That's when we lost um, a lot of really good people that worked for us. Right. Um, we had we had a great roster of um, oh my god, such an amazing roster of like correspondents and yeah. people that came in and worked for us that were just not used properly. I wish we could relaunch today with the vision and the freedom that we have with that group of people because it was, it was Hector Navarro and Eric Ishi, Alicia Malone. Um, luckily, Daniel Radford is still around and right. works with us. But we had so many great people that we brought on that we just c- couldn't keep. Right. Um, and, you know, people don't get a lot of times, and I don't mean the people that worked with us, but public facing, a lot of times people don't get the realities of that. And they're like, a screen junkie sucks. They fired all these people. It's just like we. There's money involved in all that, man. We, 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 do we it. have yeah. literally no control over right. that. Right. Um, but, you know, there's the, we have, we've definitely made mistakes, but I, I would also say that a lot of it is just like we are at the whim a lot of times of what people above us are right. saying or doing. But you dodge a bullet in the, in the, in the sense that, again, you know, our, we have friends over at Smosh. We have friends over at Clever, mm-hmm. and they like just got yanked out of nowhere. Yeah. This report comes out that you know, hey, we're uh, they're they're done. They're they're shut down. But yeah. you guys dodge a bullet because they 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 sold you guys over to, to Fandom. Fandom mm-hmm. now houses you. Now I saw this on Movie Fights um, yesterday. Yeah. To where you got well. By the time this comes out, it'll be a little more. But um, the episode I saw was that you guys had mentioned you're still now you're gonna be looking for a studio because well we were we were. We have a different suite of offices, but yeah. we're you know not that far from where we were with Screen Junkies with the, when we worked for Defy. But we you know we're still looking for where are we going to be permanently. So we were still using through an agreement the equipment and studios uh, that we were using before. That's why Movie Fights and Screen right. Junkies News right. they're all in the same place. But now that Defy is no longer. Uh, or is definitely not in the form that they currently were. Like we are now in a position where we don't know how long we're going to have that space. Right. So we're right now currently saying like, well, we don't want to take uh, who know, weeks off of programming. We can't do that. So we're now looking like, well, where can we do our shows from? Where is the what's a permanent solution? What's a intermediary solution? So that's the thing that's kind of been visited on us from this whole thing with Defy. Yeah. Uh, but but really, what we're thinking about the most is like we know so many people that have just. 
gotten completely screwed over mm -hmm. by this, yeah. losing their jobs, losing their ad money. Uh, it, it's insane. Like right. it is incredible the amount of people that this is impacting uh, in an incredibly negative way. And it, it, for me, I can't say it's hugely shocking. Right. But I never knew that it was there was there was a capability that it would happen to this degree. Yeah, and it just goes back to leadership too. It's leadership, it's bad business, and um, I'm glad you guys have, uh, avoided it. And I I know that a lot of those people will will land on their feet. It just sucks that it happened to them. It, that it does. I mean, yeah. yeah. If, if if fandom and fandom has been great. I mean, fandom has been very willing to experiment with us and to say, you know here's what we know and here's what you know and we're going to trust you to know what you know and then we're going to see you know, we're going to have a very extensive conversation about where we merge and different ideas and things that we can spin out but they're not rushing into anything right. they're not you know just yanking things left and right like it's been a really great relationship with them so far and we're super lucky because if fandom hadn't bought us i mean you've been part of the three we would be on yeah. the street right now yeah this All of, every single one of us would be out of a job, and Screen Junkies would be on the block with Smosh and Clever. But the problem is, nobody knows who or when those are going to be bought, or if. Right. And that's awful because those are those are great brands. Number one, that and great people behind years. those brands sure. that built themselves from nothing. I'm sure that it's they, something's going to happen <laughs> with those brands. They're just they're 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 too they're too big uh, not to. But it's just unfortunate the way that it happened. Yeah. Um, now before because we we're, we're running we're running down here, but before oh, wow. before we uh, go, I, I'd be remiss if I don't talk about your career in the movie sure. trivia schmodown. Um, it's been a ride. It's yes, been it has been a long ride because uh, for those of you who don't know that Dan Merle was one of the guys, one of the first guys that I really reached out to. And it, so the Schmodown now is we're, we're approaching our sixth season. We're in the midst of, of season five. Season two was the team tournament. And I, we were still over at the After Buzz yeah. Studios. I believe you guys were doing movie fights at the time there. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it, that's where it started. If we weren't, it was very it was close. close to the, yeah. It was like, right, maybe right. We, we started the Schmodown, and I think movie fights started like four months later or something yeah. like that, whatever. So, but that, no, no. You know what? During the teams, I think it probably already started because the singles was 2014. Yeah. So, anyway, so the teams then start. You come in with Mark Riley. Team champs. You, team champs. You play, you win your first game, and in the second one, you lose to. Matt Nost and John Rogan. John Rogan. The four of us. The four of us. It just it's and that's where it begins. But it's a very different thing back then. Yeah. Um, I, I, I I still remember this is just, yeah. I still remember why I kicked myself for that match. Because the question that I didn't pull that we lost on yeah. was what David Arquette it was about a David Arquette movie. Yes. And the answer was eight legged freaks. Right. And in my head, I thought for some reason that you'd said David Kep. Oh, okay. And so I was thinking on the completely wrong track. And I'm not saying I would have come up with that answer, but I think if I had heard correctly David right. Arquette, I might have. And I still think about that. It's true. Well, look, that, there, and, and the rules that. were so different back then. Yeah. There were no JTE rules. There was there was no um there was no two, three, five pointers in the third no. round. It was betting it was betting round was the final thing. It was a very different league back then. And then I call you up in, in uh, 2016 and I say Look, man, I'm going to start the Schmodown. I'm going to put it on Collider. I want you to be my first match, <laughs> and I want you to to face John Campia yeah. in a in a one on one. And the what people don't realize is that the whole wrestling angle that eventually started it, it really begins with those two promos. Like because because you're not you're not known you're not the guy that's known when you look at the Schmodown no. as the character guy or the 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 guy who's going to talk the, a lot of smack, but. If someone pushes you in a smack talk battle, you're one of the best. I mean, because you you did it brilliantly against Roca in your battles. But it was that opening thing with you and Campia that really started to sell that first fight. I think it's over like three hundred thousand views right now. I remember uh, there was one. It's still on my YouTube channel. The, the first promo I ever did was John had done something at home. Yeah. And I just I I was with Mara and I was like I showed her I was like can you believe that? And so um, I I just remember I called him Joe. Yeah, it's like yeah, I, I, all right, Joe. You want to? You know, it's just it's, I was literally walking around I my apartment. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, that was like the first promo I think, like between two people, uh, for, on the new iteration of the Schmodown. It was the one that shaped what it it got my wheels turning because Jonathan Voiko, who was the editor who cut it at the time, mm -hmm. I said, "Look, this is great what these guys are doing on social media." I was like, "Take." both of these and let's cut some music behind it and put it and then it started to shape I mean now they're like so elaborate um, but it it started that so when you saw that yeah. did you know right away what I was going for 
Well, I remember it came out the I, the narrative. I remember because it came out the same day as Batman v Superman. Okay. And so people were like, "Oh, this yeah. big thing!" I, not for nothing, by the way. I was I, there was a lot of pressure put on me to win that match. Oh, by I, third parties, I'm sure that I was told that there was more writing on it than just my personal. It was Screen Junkies versus Collider. Exactly. Yeah. So I was told in no uncertain terms that I was to win that match. No, you lose that match. <laughs> no, that I was to win. That I. That that there was a lot of pro, at pride, but besides my personal pride yeah. at stake, and that I needed to go out there and win that. Oh match. right, 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 right. Um, so that was a little extra motivation. It was like Joe Lewis and, and Max Schmeling. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I had I just had a, I'm just saying I had a little extra push to go out there and do well because right. uh, I you know I, it wasn't like you're fired, but it was just like you need you need you really need you can't right. lose this. Well, because it, people don't realize too, it was very different in 2016, and I and I would and I you could you could rival me on this if you want. I don't think you will, but. I think in 2016, even though, you know, publicly it was always like we're friends, and we were. We definitely were mm -hmm. friends. But there was definitely a camaraderie between Screen Junkies and Collider at the time. And yeah. because of whatever leadership or whatever it might be, there was that's what it was. I don't feel that that's there now anymore. I I've don't... never seen People like to build it up into a rivalry. Yeah. It's like we're two, we're two companies that happen to work in the same – Space, yeah, but it's not like. But back then it was different though because of what you said. The like competition in, was emerging, yes, in the sense of like everyone was just like, "What do we do? We're all competing for the same, you know." Yes, if it's like when you come over here now to compete, no one's saying to you, "You got to win that match." Mm -hmm. it, it's not. It's not like that anymore. No. It's not. It's not a collider or a screen junkies thing anymore. We're all in the space. You're as much a part of a sh uh, the schmodown as a face of the schmodown as John Roca is, who works here. So it's like it's different. But it was different back then. There's no doubt it was about different. it. Yeah, yeah, and and it wasn't the kind of like now. It's like it's easy. Which is like, hey, a lot of people watch it, so you could go represent screen junkies and fandom. Like, yep. awesome. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I it's it's cr it's kind of crazy what it's grown into. Yeah. If I'm being honest, yeah. and it's taken me by surprise. Obviously, yeah. Uh, when I when I was gone, what even happened? So uh, I I never thought that it would be what it is. I mean, it's I don't me I don't know how you how you do it. How do you do it? Like well, the amount of things going on. And by the way. Storylines uh, centered around uh, events over which you have no control. Right. I have. I don't know how you do. You got to write too. I mean, it's. Yeah. It, well, I related to you before when you said um, you liked editing so much because you're putting together a puzzle. Yeah. It's the same thing. Okay. It really just think about it in in those terms to where it's like so perfect example, and we'll we'll talk about it briefly. Like the the collision match. Um, <laughs> like I I I was you know like everyone else. You watched my face during mm -hmm. that match. I, like everyone else, thought you were going to wipe the floor with, with Andrew Guy and then come in. And I was like, okay, so my next live event, I'm going to have Dan Merle and Sam Levine, the two guys who were the greatest. We're going to, we'll put the title on the line. It'll be a live event. I can see the awning. And then I saw, I literally saw the awning on fire. <laughs> um, but it also shows the, the, the two things. One, I never fixed the game. Yeah. Um, two, it's how unpredictable it is. And three, what people don't understand about that match, and we'll just get right into it now. Sure. You had so much pressure on you. Um, there was, so, and, and, I, and I'll say it if you want. There was so much pressure on you for being because it, it is unfair sometimes because you had such a dominant run yeah. in that first one, going five and zero, beating some really good guys. Um, you know, then you, you come back at the collision, you win it again. You're, you you retire seven and two, and you're like this mythical figure that who the hell can really hold that up? And then you come back. And it's like, oh, he's going to just crush him. And you come here. You haven't played in over a year. Yeah. After the big build that we do at the live event, there's 100 people just in the audience here watching. Mm -hmm. And then knowing that there's going to be thousands of people watching. You you can visibly tell that you it was very different from what it was from the beginning for you. There's a lot of components to it. Number one was I... I mean, people had told I, I. I sorry, but I had not kept up with the Schmodown yeah. in my time away. I didn't. There's know, a lot going I, on I on the other I side. I didn't know yeah. who Guy was. I had. I honestly, I, not in the sense of like, oh, who is this guy? Right. I literally didn't know. Right. Uh, all I had been told was like, oh, you got to crush him. I'm like, okay. Uh, the night before, which was stupid, uh, was the first time that I actually went back and watched him play, and I watched like his last couple matches, and I turned tomorrow and I was like, this is not a. This is not somebody who I'm just gonna roll over like he he's he he knows he knows stuff. some yeah, stuff yeah. uh that was number one number two you're right was the expectation like you can add, i was standing backstage before we started and listening to you and mark talk and mark's just like yeah round round two if we even get that far it's gonna yeah. be blah 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 it's yeah. like this is gonna be i mean this is the, the most the comeback of the greatest player ever this is david and goliath and i you can ask roca roca riley and inman and knows i turned around to them 
when you guys were talking and I said, they're teeing me up, man. And I like I leaned over and mocked putting a tee and a, and a golf ball in there. I was just like, <laughs> I am getting teed up. And I told them. Yeah. I told them before the match. I was like, I got a bad feeling about this. Really? It's too perfect. It's too perfect a situation f- for a guy to win and for me to lose. That was the second component. Uh, the third component was the fact that I just flat out didn't know the answers right. to what I was asked. Well, you caught bad runs. That opponent's I, I, choice Opponent's season, choice right? on the yeah. wheel. I hit that like four times this yeah. season. Uh, I, and it's just sometimes you know the questions, and sometimes you don't know the questions. Right. I didn't know the questions. That's another thing. And then the, the other thing that really caught me off guard – I did not know how the game had changed. Before, like, I played Roka. I right. played, like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I've played the shit talkers. Right. I know you, how to do you this. You had never played an actual <clears throat> character before. No, because Roka, you know, he, on the mic before the game, what, I mean, he's, he right. is on, on fire. Right. But then he'd walk out, and you play the game. Uh, I was not used to the fact that I would be sharing the ring with a character. Right. And uh, it really threw me off my game. Um, it really, I, I, it just, it took me by surprise, yeah. if I'm being honest, just because there was a certain decorum that I was used to yeah. that was not there. Uh, and so, I, it, 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 as I told you, I'm very competitive. I'm very competitive, but I was also a kid that was bullied when I was right. young. Right. So and he he is the, the the Ginger Guy character is the epitome of a bully. Right. Yes. So there were a lot of survival ends, and I'm losing. Right. A game, and and I, it's hard to explain the sight of me sitting at the table and looking at the audience and every, not just when I started losing, every single answer that I got wrong, people were just like, oh my God, what's right. going on? Right. And like, I'm just like, I'm getting questions wrong and then I get it wrong and I'm looking out there and I just see people, like faces going like, oh, and then people like laughing and it's just like, I, 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 I was completely caught in the right. headlights right. and then I got this guy over here, I don't know what's going on and I got like other, I have other survival instincts that yeah. are kicking in yeah. and I just, it, it, it was a complete, uh, uh, c- catastrophe right. for me and, on every level, and such a different, such a different pull. When you go back in time here, and we go to again, the Campion match happens, and you win that convincingly. To where it, that was even before we created the. It, it was then you know um, retcon to give you the TKO, right? But at the time that we didn't have TKOs, no we didn't TKOs, have knockouts. There was yeah. no, we didn't even know what that was yet. And then you beat Scott Mance. Um, and then you get a shot at the title, and that's when I think you were the Screen Junkies movie fight champion at the time. Now, yeah. because the championships now, as you know, people take them very seriously. Yes. The team championships, <clears throat> the inner geekdom champion, um, the the uh, all of them, the Star Wars champion, they're taken very seriously. And at the time, the movie fights championship was very again another one people took very serious. Yeah. So when I tell you, you know, you're gonna, and I, again, you're competitive, and you've been champion in one one league, and for that same exact reason to where you got to win this fight against Campia, it's like take the belt home from Screen Junkies, as I'm sure was part of the conversation, too. Uh, I mean, not so much no. that. No, okay. No, okay. I think it was just more like uh, for that first match was just like you're our guy, right? and they're putting out their guy. And so, you know, you need to go out there and beat their guy. Right. Okay. And you did. Do and that. You did, you did it, uh, and then some. But... You win, the, so the championship match against Riley is really where you, because Riley was a dominant champion. He yeah. had never lost before. He was five and zero going into that match with you. You beat him. You guys are since really close friends. Remember the horsemen yeah. together. Um, and that match, uh, I think, then shifted. I remember driving to Screen Junkies because, it, because again, this is something I learned from doing Thursday night fights. Mm-hmm. If you've got to take whatever you're doing as serious, that's why I don't really. When you said that fans were getting on you for taking it so serious the first couple. <laughs> yeah. It's why you're as good as you are, though. It's why people look at you now, even though you might have done some adjustments. It's why you are, like, the most pristine fighter that has ever been there before, and it's why you're here because you do take it so serious. And it's the same reason I drove that belt out to you mm. because I said, okay, I'm going to present the championship. They still have that picture. Of, I, think it's, I think it's on the Patreon. Actually, That's when right. I'm, when yeah, I'm, when in I'm, our office. Yeah, That's and, I'm, right. and I'm handing you the belt because – the it is it was a matter of we're proud to have you as the champion. Um, the belt does mean a lot, and if you don't take it serious, then the audience won't take it serious. Mm-hmm. If you treat it as if every storyline is the most important one that you have, and every character and every fight is the most important one you have, they will see it the same way. That is that is just the way you have to run your league because if you don't take it serious, no one else will. Because yes, you could just say it's just a movie trivia show. Mm-hmm. Then that's the way everyone else will see it. Sure. But if it means something to other people, if it means something to you, then that's when you've got a formula. Yeah. And I, I think 
what's emerging is, and I think there's been some bumps in the road, certainly for me, is the the, the, the sort of different kinds of players that the Schmodown uh, generates, which is that I think you've got people like uh, Guy who are great characters for the show, uh, and that's and not to say that he's not he he knows a lot of stuff, yeah. but like he's a great character for the show. Um, and then you have shades in between that, and then I think there's people like me, and uh, you know, I kind of get this vibe from Rachel Cushing yeah. and Clark Wolf, who take this game extraordinarily seriously, and um, don't necessarily jibe with the other side of the spectrum. So I think that's the learning curve that's happening right, right. now, is the, the people that are playing the game, and it's like, you know, like I'm here to play the game and I'm here to answer questions. And then the people that are like, I'm also here to do that, but I'm also playing a part. And I think that's the oil and water sometimes. Yeah. And that's everybody's navigating is like, it, it, it's 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 like it's like merging two different sports. It's exactly right. It's, well, it, well <laughs> you know? I mean, again, it's, it's like putting it's like putting a WWE guy yeah. in the ring with like a Greco-Roman wrestler. It's you with the UFC and fighter trying to figure out with how the UFC to do fighter. it. Like the UFC fighter is going to come in and just wants to do the fight, and the, and the wrestling guy wants to cut a promo. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. That's what it is. And I think people. Are getting used to it in each, and and I think team action. So where you and Riley and Roca, you guys are, are like the old school players, right? You've been through all of it. As where action came in as characters, like it's this the mm -hmm. evolution of these guys who have become characters, and you also Andrew Guy, Mike Kalinowski, John Roca, mm -hmm. actors. Yeah. So they 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 get right. they they get it. They that's what that's what they do. So we're gonna see that. And we're gonna see that evolution. It's also on the the management to also make sure that we navigate to say like, okay, look, this is what's gonna happen inside of this. Be prepared for this. This could happen. Um, and you gotta prep people because yeah. that's that's what that's what that's ultimately what what it's gonna be if we want to keep growing it. Um, like the Horseman moment was incredible at the live event. That was incredible. That was like. Man, that was amazing, and that I'm was sure incredible. I mean, because I remember. So, so for people who don't know, and again, just paint because just because I, I know how much time we have here. Um, Dan had played in five straight matches before he he had lost. He beat Mark Ellison in one a very underrated match. That was a great match. Such a good match. Very underrated back and forth. Go and watch that match. Was Shmodown spectacular one the main event. Then um, you play Roca in mm -hmm. what people still say is one of the best title matches of all time. We changed the rule afterwards because if if it would have been because it went from you it was the first question in round five at your the time you played was only worth one point uh -huh. had it been worth two it would have been sudden death of course um, naturally naturally Joe so Dante. I know it was a Joe Dante Burbs. so so that match biggest one of the biggest rivalries you guys are now teammates yeah who'd have thunk it um, and then you you come back you have a great free for all amazing free for all. And you, we get, we, you get a shot because of the past stuff that you did. You get a shot. You beat Riley and Roca in that collision match, which is one of, the, one of the best things that has ever happened as far as just big main event that delivered. Sam Levine, but people don't realize, people don't realize that you, that you and Sam have played before. That's you, true. A lot of people don't, don't seem to remember that. They don't remember it. And you beat Sam, not even to a five-pointer. You had just played, and that, that is not easy to do, to play, first of all, two matches in the day, yeah. two matches back-to-back, -back, very hard to do. You do that, you beat Sam. You and I have a very strange match. Um, that was the, maybe that was a very odd match. Those were some of the hardest questions. Those were so hard. Ever. Like who played Paul Bunyan in the Tall Dude, Tale or whatever? You and I looked at each other <laughs> like, and was what? like, "What is happening?" You surprised me. People ask me all the time if I knew that that was coming that you were going to retire. No, I no. had no idea. You you sprung on me. I mean, I even I joke in the in the match and I go, "Shit! If I would have known you were going to do this, I would have lost." Um, and then we then you step away. Yeah. Um, now getting you back. Was um, was interesting because you had approached me at one point, mm -hmm. and was, actually to even flip to that, the end of that when I'm when I'm hugging you, yeah. I say I'm gonna get you back, and then you th you told me afterwards you're like we'll talk next year and see how the free for all is looking, yeah, because I think the free for all always stung you the way you went out against Andreco, mm -hmm. um, but so free for all what mm -hmm. was supposed to happen was you were legit supposed to come back for that, yeah. Um, yeah, I that 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 that's a little bit of an element that made guy a little bit tougher for me. Yeah. And no, nobody knows if, if you're okay with Go me going into yeah, it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I I was the Jaws music <clears throat> at the free for all was supposed to be me. Yeah, uh, I was. That was I. I love that event, and I was looking forward to it. And a few days before that happened, I got a uh, a call that my uncle had died, right. and he was um, when I talked about my mom and. 
the people in my life who had a huge influence on me, um, he was like one of the the ones. And and particularly in my movie, uh, my love of movies, we would every holiday season, every Thanksgiving, that's what that was our tradition. We would go see two or three movies yeah. together. And every time, every time I we talked on the phone, we talked movies. And um, and he he passed away very suddenly. Um, and my, I had thought that maybe I could, I, I wanted to go out and play f- for him. And it literally, his funeral was happening at the exact same time and date as the free for all. Uh, so I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And, uh, that, that was also part of my sort of, I didn't know what was happening. Right. I didn't know what had happened. Um, that was part of my confusion with the whole guy thing was right. like not only did I not know who he was, but then I, I you know I heard like oh well he came out and said he killed you and I'm like what uh, what what huh right um, but I think a part of me was was sort of like well I I've told you this I yeah. shouldn't logistically yeah and just intellectually I should never have taken that fight because yeah. I was a no win scenario. There was no way that I would not. All I had was all I all I could do was lose. Right. Well, um, I, I mean, because if you if you won, you if were, I won, you I was expected supposed to win. to win. Yeah. The the idea behind it, as a promoter side of it too, was that guy is a big character, a huge character. I could promote it in the way that we did. Right. The promotion leading up to it, the I took out Dan Merle. Right. The hey, this that that the, the horseman thing that went off perfect at the live event, his promo and everything too. Yeah. The promotion of it, everything went according to plan. I. And I've told him this, and I tell you this: I grossly underestimated Guy, yeah. um, and I thought we don't need Guy to win. We just need Guy to talk shit, Guy, and then Guy's zero and one, and he, I can put him up against anybody. Right. And there he goes, and I, I was like, and, and you know, I always, I always map out. But what if the other person wins? I mm-hmm. didn't do it for this fight. I just didn't fathom it could happen. So I just was planning the Levine versus Merle match. Yeah. So it wasn't a matter of. You like a no win situation because it was just like yeah, just give him another. He gets another win. He goes in and now he's eight and he's eight and two mm-hmm. against Sam Levine, who's having this run, and it looks sexier with eight and two and this and this. Yeah. So yes, in hindsight, putting up against a guy that could win that fight, probably not the best idea for you. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, and I think part of it because you know I took that really hard. Yeah. And I think part of it was that it is still in my brain tied a little bit to that. Um, as far as you know, the reason that I was not at the free for all, and the reason why it all happened to begin right, with, was right. because uh, I was I was grieving, um, you know, um, a very love dear family member. Now I I now have transitioned to, uh, I think about him now. My my ritual now is I think about him before I play, because. Uh, ra- he would never want him. St- he would never want to be a painful memory to me. Yeah. So now, before I play, I think about him in the context of how much our relationship was informs how much I love movies and what I love about playing the game and what I love about movies in general because it was such a big part of it. And so it, I've I've sort of been able to turn that from a very painful thing to something I used to motivate me and honestly something that I've used to put this game in perspective because um, that's what's important in life is those are the things you need to take seriously. Right. Um, and so it's been a bit of a journey, but a lot of it is sort of I, I now he's he's something that I use to sort of center myself before I play and just say, you know, you win it or you lose it. It's fine. Well, like, I saw that. I saw that, and I saw it so much in that game and the post-interview for the corruption match. Yeah. Because it was a fantastic match. People are talking about that team match, sudden death. You know, the controversy aside, um, that it was just one of the best-played matches on both sides. The vibe between you and Roka working so well. But it was that post-match mm-hmm. to where you – it was – John was upset. Mm-hmm. You were just kind of level to – basically what you said, and I loved it, it was – just the same way that this guy was here for me after that loss, I'm gonna be here for him because, and it's it's essentially what you just said just now, mm-hmm. it's putting it into perspective because it makes me excited to see what you're gonna do in this tournament coming up. We're, I mean, we're, we are a week away from the singles yeah. tournament and you're playing Stacey Howard. Mm-hmm. 
Stacey Howard, you have history with in the live event, and yeah. she almost single-handedly, because Winston admits he just didn't have a great game, sure. and she kept them into that game. She's great. She's really good. She's really strong, and and that's why, you know, when I see people talking about, like, you know, the, the, the hype and stuff, the other you know, brackets were announced, and the hype is just like, oh, well, no. Dan Merle versus like no one should ever say that any match is a walkover, but especially not with Stacy. Like right. he was like, "Well, Dan will be Stacy." Like, no, that's not. Don't say that because right. the last time somebody said that about me, I lost. Right. Uh, so if part of me is just like I would say to the fans, it's just like you know, like w- learn from the game. Like don't don't ever anybody can win ever discount yeah. a competitor yep. because anybody can win. Finstock could hit. Sly and Arnie on yeah. you, and he's going to have a good shot. And then he's and then he and then he wins that game. Right. Uh, so I mean, even if Stacy was a complete unknown and had never played the game before, I I would say you know like don't ever discount anyone, but especially because like it's not like she's zero and eight in this game. No, like she, was, she she's she, played well. She's and been in number one contender matches before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She she took down Ellis, she right? Did. Yeah. Uh, she certainly. I, I mean, if you go point for point, I would say she probably either. Uh, outplayed both John and I, or or uh, was at least right there with us. She tied. was the so, whole reason that, that that team had a chance to beat you yeah. guys at the live event for sure. Um, so she definitely is not someone to take lightly, and I know no. you're not. But so there's two s- scenarios in the, in this tournament here. The one is the is the obvious. Yeah. You, you win you win this whole thing. You play John Roca for a um, record third time. Mm-hmm. To become the three-time champion, um, which I know is something you're, you're aiming for, or yeah. the other side of the scenario, so people don't know it yet, and we can we can talk about it here. It'll probably come out by the time this comes out. Mm-hmm. The two semifinalists, whoever that 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 lose, yeah. will also have a chance in the number one contender, a chance to get to the number one contender match. Right. Um, so whoever loses the finals, so there's going to be there's a chance for you to get that third title. I assume mm-hmm. it's going to want you want to do it against Roca. Well, yeah, I yeah. mean, like well, that's like the storybook ending is yes. uh, you know you go from losing your first match back to having a chance to come back and play at the at the end of the year against the guy who you were on a team with earlier that right. year, who's and who also took the title in your from faction, you. Yeah, who yeah. took the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of yeah. course that's the story. story. Yeah, 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 that's what I want to do. Right. But and if I was writing it, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> but there's but a lot knows? of people between right. me and that. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people in between it stacked this year. This is your first singles yeah, tournament like, ever. It's a crazy stacked you amount of people. So listen to this. Guys, this is, this is the rundown. I'm going to let Dan out of here. The rundown for it. On one side of the bracket, you got Mark Andreco and McWeeny. Quick, yeah. quick pick on that. Who you got? Oh my God! Between those two, yep. I mean, that's gonna be that's a 50-50 match. I might, I might just say McWeeny. Okay. Just because he, that, he's scary. I, that's he's scary. Yeah. yeah. Clark Wolf, Ben Bateman. Man, I, I think I think Wolf's experience in singles, in particular, is gonna do a, a okay. lot of favors there. Other side of the bracket, you got Ethan Irwin um, mm-hmm. and uh, the new kid, the kid you know, Chance Ellison. Ooh, yeah. man. I've seen a lot of Chance. Chance is really good. I think Ethan's hungry, though. Ethan's hungry? Because he had, he, he had his chance he earlier did. He three, this year. He was 3-0, oh, loses to Andreco. yeah. Yeah, I, I want to say, it's good. I think it's going to be a good fight, but I think I think the hunger might might push Ethan over the edge. Okay, and then obviously you're going to pick yourself. So then you versus Ethan, you're going to take yourself all the way to the finals. <laughs> so on the other side of the bracket there, do we have you have Clark Wolf versus McWeeny? Uh, yeah. So who do you got now? Ooh. Again, I've seen what... Um, through team play, I've seen what Clark is capable of, yeah. along with Rachel, when yeah. she is like hungry and motivated. Not that she ever isn't, right. but I think uh, the 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 idea of becoming not just a teams champion, but becoming a singles champion again, it goes to hunger. Yeah. When, when people are so closely matched, it goes to hunger. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna Wolf. go with Wolf. I'm going with Wolf. So well, I like a Wolf Merle matchup. That Ooh. to me, that we've seen it before. We saw it in 2016. I think Wolf's it's a much a different, different player. That's a completely sure. different era. So a Wolf Merle matchup, I like it. Um, I like how. Uh, uh, honest, you were on this show. I think yeah. we could have probably talked for another two hours. Easily. If we wanted to easily. <laughs> Pleasure to have you, my man. Um, check out Dan Merle. You can follow him on Twitter. It's at Merle Dan. Or at it? Merle Dan. At Merle Dan. Watch him on Screen Junkies. They will have a home. I promise you, one way or another. And then uh, anything else you want to? People should be looking out for. Uh, no, just uh, again, uh, we talked about it a little bit, but we're we're so excited to be part of fandom now yeah. and the opportunities that we're going to get you know it's stuff that we are we're not jumping into anything but i just know from being in on a lot of uh, different things that 
we are number one working on making everything that we currently do better as we always try to be but we're also working on some ideas for the future that i'm super excited about so we're just we're, we feel very fortunate that we are still able to do what we love and uh, it's something we continue to love to do. Well, there you go, guys. Once again, Dangerous Dan Merle. And make sure that you subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done that already. Um, download it on Apple Podcasts or wherever else. And leave a comment, rate, review. Leave some comments on the YouTube channel. And we will catch you next time. That was it. That was the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're joining us for the first time on Collider Video, hit that subscribe button, like, comment, do all that stuff. And remember, this is also on iTunes. If you're listening to iTunes right now, pull over and then rate it, subscribe it, do all that stuff. Hit pause on the treadmill for a second and let us know what you think about these shows. And we will continue to make more of them. You can find all your favorite shows from Collider on iTunes on the Collider Podcast Network. Thank you very much. See you next time.